Welcome to Democratic Dialogue. Uh, this is February um, 2018, and we're very pleased uh, today to have as our guest John Rosenthal. And uh, John is the co-chairman of the Police Assisted Recovery Initiative, or PARI, um, and he will tell us about it um, as the program goes on, and I will be asking some questions. Um, I chair the Democratic City Committee in Gloucester. Uh, John and I are both Gloucester residents, um, and I think we're going to explore uh, a number of things that most of you have never even heard about with uh, regard to PARI. Um, and anyway, I hope that as the, I, I know also that this program will air on YouTube, so that makes it very possible to share the content with, with others. Um, but let's turn to John. Um, I know uh, you founded PARI in 2015 with the former police chief of Gloucester. And he launched this program on social media. And in probably less than three years, PARI has become an or a nonprofit organization uh, that has national reach and scope. Um, I'd love to hear more about, first of all, how did you ever get involved in something like this? And tell us about your own background. Um, sure. Well, thanks for having me. Um, as a Gloucester resident, uh, I've been very impressed with the Gloucester police and how they have uh, really exemplified community policing for a long time. Um, I got to know Chief Campanello when I, as the leader of the effort in Massachusetts to enact responsible gun laws that have actually proven to work and resulted in uh, Massachusetts having the lowest gun death rate in the nation, even as an industrial, you know, urban state, um, due to changing bad public policy around access to guns to good public policy leading to good public health outcomes. Um, so the chief and I worked together on a gun bill that uh, Speaker DeLeo had championed uh, in 2014. And, um, and, and he was so helpful, I, and I enjoyed you know, sort of working with him that I, I said, if there's anything you ever need now that I live full-time in Gloucester, um, let me know. And so um, when he decided uh, with the blessing of the mayor, uh, Safathia, to... Um, to look at the opioid crisis differently. Uh, as a career law enforcement officer, he and many others came to the conclusion that law enforcement will never be able to arrest their way out of a public health epidemic. And so uh, he announced, uh, starting on June 1st of 2015, anyone with the disease of opioid addiction could come into the Gloucester Police Department with or without their drugs and instead of being shamed, blamed, and stigmatized uh, and accused of moral failing by, you know, the healthcare system as well as everybody else, um, they would be uh, treated with respect and helped into treatment, not jail. Um, and when he, he announced that, and like you said, on social media, it really caught fire. Uh, he approached me and we went for coffee at Cape Ann Coffee and, and said, I think we're going to be inundated. I think this is going to catch hold and as you have done with homelessness and gun violence, would you start a nonprofit that can help support the Gloucester Angel program as well as help replicate it across the state and nationwide. Now this was like in April 2015. We didn't know if anyone would show up when the police uh, made the announcement and uh, you know, Lo and behold, through the voice of law enforcement beginning right here in our little community of Gloucester, um, this program, the PARI program and the Gloucester Angel program and similar um, law enforcement based access to treatment programs um, is now been replicated in 375 police wow. departments in 32 states and um, it has already changed the conversation from opioid addiction as a crime that should you know, result in jail to a, a disease um, where people need treatment. And um, the dividends, you know, sort of the social dividends have been unbelievable. Not only have we saved lives, I mean, 600 people 
over 600 people have come into the Gloucester Police Department alone and received access to treatment the same day. Over 250 treatment centers across the country have offered the Gloucester Police Angel Program free treatment for anyone that can't afford it. Um, and now we have 375 police departments uh, doing similar programs and we have placed over 12,000 people wow. into treatment since the Gloucester Angel Program began on June 1st of 2015. Yeah. Wow, by any measure, I think that's an astounding success, you know, growth. Like any organization that kind of grows quickly, I'm sure there have been growing pains, um, unexpected consequences in some ways, expected. Um, could you talk a little bit about the, some of the challenges yeah. as, as you've grown? So unlike gun violence, for instance, that has a life opponent in the gun industry and the NRA who would just assume see more gun violence, more fear, more gun sales, more gun violence, and you know, just it's a deadly cycle. Um, with the opioid crisis, I think uh, it's much harder uh, for the life opponents to be vocal. So the pharmaceutical industry largely created this crisis mm -hmm. along with the healthcare system unknowingly or unwittingly. Um, so we haven't had big barriers. I mean, this is, if, if you were to ask members of Congress on, on both sides of the aisle, uh, is this a problem? They'd all agree it's a problem. Um, the problem comes down to uh, the solution that requires fine, you know, funding and the Republican Party doesn't want to fund anything other than tax breaks for the rich. So this epidemic was largely manufactured out of greed, starting with one family, the Sackler family, mm -hmm. who owns Purdue Pharma. And they created OxyContin in 1996, at the same time they lobbied hard to get the FDA to allow the pharmaceutical industry to, to market and advertise directly to people and doctors. We're the only country that does that. So we're 5% of the world's population and we now consume over 80% of all prescription <clears throat> painkillers. And today, another 175 people will die from overdoses. And so what we started here in Gloucester with the ANGEL program is a recognition, one, you can't arrest your way out of this, two, it's a disease versus a crime that needs treatment, not jail, and there's only two options, long-term treatment or death. Right. And like the crack epidemic, which was truly an epidemic, but it impacted inner city black kids and no one paid attention. This has been an epidemic for a long time, but it's been recognized as an epidemic quickly, relatively quickly, because it's largely white, suburban, and rural kids right. dying at, you know, at a, mm -hmm. an alarming rate. So we are making huge progress in changing the conversation but, and saving lives. So starting with the saving lives piece, we, we distribute Narcan, nasal Narcan, which is an overdose blocking drug. Um, We've distributed over 10,000 doses across the country. Every first responder and every family member should have it on hand, especially if they have someone who's addicted in the household. And we're also doing recovery coaches. So at Gloucester Police, we have Tito Rodriguez. He's actually with PARI. He's across the street from the Gloucester Police Department. But he does the recovery coaching and helping people go from one level of treatment to the next. And we have 25 AmeriCorps members uh, working within police departments across the country. Um, and we're going to continue that model of trying to save lives with Narcan on the front end and support long term treatment with recovery coaches mm -hmm. on the back end. And then hopefully the healthcare system will fill in and treat the people with this disease just like they do cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Right. So, talk a little bit about the training component. In other words, let's say I'm a police chief in Iowa and I hear about the program, and I know that there might be other police chiefs around the country, and I probably make a few phone calls, but how would I, as the police chief now, get 
the help or contact the PARI, what w would PARI send somebody um, with the, some of the funding you've gotten to, to help me? Or do I go to a training institute or what, what happens? So we have full-time staff. We're located right here in Browns Mall. Um, and we have been highlighted in the New York Times and Washington mm -hmm. Post and um, Anderson Cooper and you name it, New England Journal of Medicine. So a lot of people have heard about us. And while on one hand, Trump has announced a 95% cut to ONDCP, the, the, office, the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, he announced last week, just about two months after he invited us to the White House to stand on the stage with him while he was going to make a major announcement about the opioid epidemic being a public health mm -hmm. emergency. And, well, in fact, what he said is it was going to be a national emergency, sort of like the AIDS epidemic, and it would have unleashed billions of dollars from reserves to fund a national emergency. By the time, you know, between the time we got invited to the White House, and I chose not to go, but we did send other chiefs. Um, and the time he made his announcement, he said it was going to be a public health emergency, and the fund for public health emergencies is exactly $57,000 for the entire country. Uh -huh. and, and then last week, he announced a 95% cut in the White House Office of National Drug Control right. Policy right. that does the law enforcement and the support around these um, pre-arrest programs like we are doing. So the White House, on one hand, is cutting, and on the other hand, the acting director of the National Drug uh, Office thinks we are the greatest thing since sliced bread, and he's constantly lifting and promoting, which is a great thing, but mm -hmm. unfortunately his boss yes. um, isn't doing well. the same. But the, but the fact is, so people know about us now. Um, they contact us. Um, to be a member, a law enforcement member of, of PARI, all you have to do is recognize that this is a disease versus a crime that needs treatment, not jail. And if you say you want to join, you're a member. And then we give you the list of 250 treatment centers that will provide scholarships for anybody who comes through police departments uh, and needs help. Um, we will give them a startup grant of one to five thousand dollars, which you know we're, we're mm -hmm. a five hundred one c three nonprofit, so we bring in tax deductible contributions, and then we buy Narcan or we give startup grants, um, and then we also uh, have on our website, which is parausa.org, um, best practices. Um, so we have okay. two primary models that are being followed by the 375 police departments. One is the Gloucester Angel program, which is an intake model. Come in, we'll bring bring your drugs and paraphernalia. No shame, no blame, no judgment. We'll get e get you into treatment. Mm -hmm. Or the Arlington police model, which is absolutely fascinating. So my co-chair of PARI is uh, Chief Fred Ryan from Arlington. What he figured out is that the greatest predictor of the next overdose death is today's overdose reversal or save with Narcan. So they know who police and first responders have helped save with Narcan. So within 24 hours, the chief would send a clinician, a social worker embedded in the police department. Now we have that here in Gloucester with Tito. Um, and a uniform officer to go make a visit at the household out, you know, within 24 hours of the overdose save and say, look, we can get you into treatment today if you're ready. Right. And if you're not ready, here's Narcan if, you, if, if you, know, you overdose again and we'll come back. They also do um, follow up. So when a, when a detective comes to Chief Ryan and says, we're ready to take down a dealer, we've got the evidence, Chief, can we do it? He said, yep, looks good, but what are you going to do for the dealer's clients? Because we're about to have a whole lot of very sick people in our community. When you take out a, a heroin dealer, rather than, you know, we don't want the people to go and find another dealer, and there's three more waiting behind to take over that client base. So when the chief arrests <clears throat> this dealer, gets the phone, gets the computer, gets the client list, then the clinician and officer goes to the home of the user and said, we've taken out your dealer. Rather than find a new dealer where you may be getting, instead of heroin, fentanyl, and dying, how about getting into treatment? And if you're not ready, here's Narcan. The, <clears throat> the level of trust 
that has been built up through, you know, post-Baltimore, Ferguson, you name it, where now police are the heroes in the community yeah. saving lives and changing um, national drug policy is, uh, it's just a win-win yeah. all the way around. Well, that's an amazing um, <clears throat> development in the sense that, you know, only the police department would have access to that information. Yep. And you go to a public health clinic and the public health person can't, because of privacy laws, of course can't find out who all the users are um, or go to the house because, again, it's everybody's privacy is being protected. But I just want to go back to the availability of treatment. And I know most of the, at least just from what I've read, I it looks, <coughs> seems as though many of the addicts who present at a police departments um, want inpatient treatment, but maybe not. Is So what what is the availability of outpatient treatment versus inpatient treatment? And I'm thinking, for example, of younger women who may have children at home and no one else to step in and care for them, but they desperately need treatment. But probably outpatient might be a better model. Or who knows? Some uh, oh, There have to be all kinds of arrangements for this family. Right. They need so, help, in other words. So absolutely outpatient long-term treatment is the solution. Um, this is a disease uh, that, like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, responds. It's a chronic disease without a cure, but it responds really well to medication. Medication-assisted treatment. And so the, the, the amount of time that anybody needs to be in a detox is generally not more than five days. And they don't always or generally don't need long-term inpatient, which is the most expensive. What they need is long-term treatment. And all options need to be available to them. Um, one of the things that was sort of an aha moment for us was, and I've experienced um, an overdose death in my family uh, eight months after I started. Pari, which is interesting, and I didn't even know my 34-year-old nephew with an MBA from Suffolk University, a well-paid uh, stock analyst, you know, became a poster boy. Back injury, overprescribed Oxycontin. So Oxycontin, made by Purdue, um, the 80 milligram pill, when you are finally cut off from your doctor, is a dollar a milligram on the street. So when you get a bottle of 30 or 60 or 90 and they're, you know, $80 a pill on the street, you can imagine the diversion uh, value. So, you know, he gets shut off. Now you need 5 to 10 a day to just go to work, just to not begin to withdraw, just to be normal because your brain chemistry has now changed. It's changed. Your brain has been rewired. You can't make dopamine, which is what gives, makes you feel pleasure, without that drug. So in any case, you know, in his case, um, you know, overprescribed, addicted, cut off from the dock, and then goes b virtually broke, buying, sure. you know, four to five to six hundred dollars a day worth of pills. It doesn't take long for anybody to go broke, steal from everyone you know, and go to heroin. So then when you go to a hundred dollar bag of heroin, you know, rather than an eight, six or eight hundred dollar habit. It's a lot, habit, lot it, cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. But now the problem is that heroin is being cut with even cheaper fentanyl, which is 50 times more potent than morphine and a hundred times more potent than heroin. And so what's happening now is that people are thinking they're doing heroin or they're being, or they're doing recreational cocaine or marijuana that is cut with fentanyl. Mm. And we have seen four overdoses in a weekend in Arlington, Mass, um, one fatal from cocaine wow. cut with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So. You know, this recreational drug taking that, you know, used to be like fairly harmless in the past with cocaine or pot is, is not any longer. But in any case, what happens is you get addicted and um, you're told there's no room in a treatment center. But what we've figured out 
and it was an aha moment, was when a police chief calls or a police officer calls, and we all in our culture grow up learning mm -hmm. not to say no to police officers, yeah. including people that work at treatment centers, there's a bed. There isn't a bed okay. when you and I call, but there is when a so police chief calls. So that's inpatient. So that's inpatient, but yeah. oftentimes because the, the, the treatment center and treatment system is so virtually non-existent and has such barriers that um, there aren't enough beds for the, for the need. People are often told, sorry, call back tomorrow or next week. Mm -hmm. And we know with any addiction, you've got to get people into treatment when they're ready. They can't be forced into treatment. And you're forced into treatment oftentimes when you go to jail and you come out and now your resistance is so low, you didn't choose to get into treatment, you were forced into treatment, and there's like a 50% higher rate of overdose death among people that come out of prison because of the resistance being so low. So I don't think prison diversion into treatment is the solution. It's often the only right. answer. So what we've done is we've expanded treatment by, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. Police chiefs can get people in treatment. They're taking yeah. it. So detox and then long-term outpatient. And we do know that the longer somebody is in treatment, 60 days is better than 30. Right. And, so, you know, wh so what is the, the sort of the pathway that PARI uses to get people into the, in other words, is it always inpatient and then outpatient? Or is it sometimes outpatient, police department and then outpatient, or whatever is available? All um, options are, are on the table for okay. anybody. We don't force anybody into anything. This is a 100% right. pre-arrest voluntary program, unlike a lot of the other programs where you're arrested, um, you're told you're going to jail, or, or you can get into treatment. Who's not going to choose treatment? But meanwhile, you've been arrested, and that, that arrest causes all kinds of chaos down the line, yes. jobs and housing and everything else. So we are a pre-arrest program. Um, not everybody needs detox, but that's usually the, f mm -hmm. the f front door to okay. long-term treatment. The problem is there isn't enough medication-assisted treatment um, available to everyone that needs it, and it is absolutely improving and getting better. And over time, the longer you're off these opioids, um, over time your brain chemistry changes back, you're able to make dopamine again, you're able to have a, you know, a productive, so in, happy life, if, if that's possible right. these days. So in Gloucester, how many outpatient treatment centers that are, that have the, the, the philosophy that it's actually going to maybe have a chance of succeeding um, are there in Gloucester? Well, we've partnered with Leahy, we've partnered so with Beverly Hospital, we've partnered with Addison Gilbert, um, and um, we have treatment centers all over, all right. over Massachusetts, like Spectrum, who will take anybody mm -hmm. that we um, need right. help for. And then we have these treatment centers around the country, and, and now we're also working with legislation. Um, so on the state level, we've worked closely with the Baker administration to enact the 2015 legislation, which is landmark. Um, and now we're working on another bill that will also require standards for the treatment industry wow. and more accountability for the treatment industry. We've also been working in Washington, and just one quick antidote, um, we were asked by the pre you know, President Obama and his previous mm -hmm. uh, uh, director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy to come to Washington um, at a time when Congress was voting on the Cures Act, the 21st Century Cures Act. They voted, but they didn't fund a billion dollars of treatment that the president had asked for. They, they all said, oh, there's a problem, but no money. We were in Washington that day meeting at the White House with the president's chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, in the Roosevelt Room. When Congress took that vote to not fund, we hold a press conference on the White House lawn with 50 chiefs in uniform from all over the country. Then we go meet with members of uh, senators on Capitol Hill, including Senator Cassidy, a Republican medical doctor from Louisiana. One of our chiefs in uniform was from southern Louisiana, and he plays a 911 tape of somebody overdosing in his parish. And, uh, and then he, you know, it's a long tape and you're hearing the, the, the wife crying, the baby's crying, the guy overdosing. 
Um, and then the chief says, so you know what I did? I did, you know, my training said I need to go arrest these people. So I, I went and arrested these people and they lost their children and they go to jail. And what did I, how did I solve anything? Now I joined the Gloucester Angel program. I've expanded it in Louisiana. We're providing access to treatment and saving lives. So now fast forward, the president signs the 21st Century Cures Act. Congress includes a billion dollars of funding and I'm at the White House standing next to Senator Cassidy who says, that day changed my vote. So wow. that's the power of law enforcement, the conservative yes. voice of law enforcement. And we're going to continue to use that until the health care system catches up and treats people with the disease of addiction just like people with every other disease. They don't need to be stigmatized, shamed, and blamed. They need long-term treatment. Right. So how are the, I mean, how would you contrast the Democratic and the Republican leadership in Congress um, with respect to drug addiction? I mean, I think we've, you've, you've just said the White House is at least cutting and sort of putting the lid on new funding. Um, but, and presumably there are other crises that are, you know, some of the leadership thinks are too important or more important than, than the opioid crisis. But um, I don't know. I mean, what do, you, what do you think the prospects are in the future yeah. for changing the, the minds of both houses of Congress? So unlike the or, gun issue both where sides. the Republican Party is owned by the yeah. NRA and won't even require a criminal background mm -hmm. check for gun sales or a ban on bump stocks after 550 people are shot in Las Vegas, right? Uh, they've done nothing. Even 20 babies, you know, six and seven year olds at Sandy Hook, nothing. But on this issue, there's a lot of bipartisanship. This is like one of the few issues they can agree on but the Republican Party won't fund the necessary treatment. We're paying for it in law enforcement, in uninsured you know, hospital visits, um, you name it. In, in 65,000 overdose deaths in 2016. 2017 will be 85,000. 2018 will be close to 100,000. And Congress won't fund a treatment system? So uh, the Republicans, you know, unfortunately, um, are talking the talk, but they're not walking the walk on funding necessary treatment. Well, thank you so much. This, um, I, I think, there's clearly there's a party. I mean, there's a lot more to be done. I think there's room, obviously, for bipartisan agreement somewhere in the future on the importance of combating with effective approaches um, opioid addiction. And there is a website, and it's the PariUSA.org. PariUSA.org. Meanwhile, we can all feel very proud that our little community of Gloucester, which used to be known as a fishing village with a heroin problem, is a fishing village with a heroin solution. And, Absolutely. Uh, our first responders are, are doing life-saving work in the meantime. Thank you so much. Thank you.